Hi, everyone. So glad a few, a few of you guys are staying here for this talk. So can you hear me well? OK. So I'm from IBM, and I'm excited to be here for this talk, which is about uh, running Spark on a high-performance cluster using really fast network and storage hardware. So um, let me start with a, um, a brief look on uh, some of the performance trends that are motivating the, the talk I'm uh, presenting today. So, um, if you've been attending Spark Summit um, earlier this year, then you may remember this table, which I copied from the keynote. It uh, basically shows that since uh, 2010, when Spark was initially released, hardware, network and storage hardware have undergone a 10x or more improvement, both in terms of latency and, and throughput. Um, in, uh, in 2010, if you, if you, if you have been, been deploying Spark, uh, on a cluster, you have put probably most of your storage on hard disks, and the network you've been using is something like a one gigabit network around that. Uh, today, if you're uh, running Spark, you will put most of your short-term storage on SSDs, and the uh, network uh, bandwidth that you have available per node will probably be around 10 gigabits per second or higher. That type of hardware is commonly available across the different cloud offerings you can buy today. Now, if you look at the high-end segment of network and storage hardware, uh, we have um, NVMe Flash, 3D X-Point coming up, 100 gigabit Ethernet, RDMA, and so on. These type of technologies offer another 10x improvement over what uh, you uh, have deployed in the cloud today. And uh, the goal of this talk is to show how we can run Spark effectively on such hardware. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to uh, give an in-depth background over, let's say, NVMe flash or RDMA. There's just no time for that. But what I do want to discuss is uh, the soft, one important aspect of these technologies, which is the software host interface. Because what makes NVMe flash and RDMA so fast is not just the fact is not just the, that the hardware is fast, but the fact that these technologies offer user-level interfaces that allow the application to access the hardware directly from user space. The traditional interface for applications to access network and storage devices, though, is through the kernel, as shown on the left-hand side. Uh, you, you would either use uh, file system APIs or socket APIs to access uh, the kernel, and then the kernel would access uh, the, the, the hardware through the device drivers and so on. And that's a perfectly valid way to uh, also use NVMe flash and 100 gigabit ethernet. So that, that's perfectly valid. You may, however, lose some performance inside the kernel due to kernel overheads, right? Think about a really fast network, like a 100 gigabit network. The actual raw round trip time you can expect just from the network cards and the switches along the path can be as low as one, two microseconds. Now, a context switch inside the kernel can easily cost you that much, so that may overshadow the performance you see at the application level. On the other hand, if you're using user space APIs, then the hardware is basically mapped into the application uh, address space and accessed uh, without kernel involvement, which gives you a much better performance uh, than the uh, traditional kernel stack. So to give you an idea, what performance you can expect when using one type of API versus the other. We made uh, two experiments. On the left side, we show the time it takes to fetch a piece of data from a remote server's DRAM. Um, and you can see, if you're using RDMA, we can essentially uh, fetch a, a few bytes in just, uh, just a few microseconds. And fetching a full 1 MB block is still um, is still below 100 microseconds, right? If, on the other hand, data transfer is implemented using standard TCP sockets, you can easily get twice that time. Uh, if the uh, data you transfer is small, it, the difference can be up to 10x. On the right-hand side, I show a similar experiment, but this time data is being fetched from a remote server flash memory. And uh, in, in, in the first configuration marked with the blue bars, the data is being fetched using NVMe over fabrics. So again, I don't have time to give an in-depth background over NVMe over fabrics, but all you need to know for this talk is that it's basically a new standard that um, enables user-level access to data that resides on remote flash memory. Essentially, with NVMe over fabrics, both the network hardware 
and the storage hardware is accessed from user space. And you can see with this, we can fetch uh, a piece of data in just uh, a 64K piece of data in just around 100 microseconds. Again, if you go through the kernel, in this case, using a block device on top of iSCSI, it takes not twice as much, but uh, substantially more time. So the, the general message here is that with modern top-of-the-line hardware executing uh, kernel instructions during I.O. operations is expensive. And, uh, rather, what you want to do is to use the user-level APIs, which gives you much better performance close to the hardware speed. So fine. So now um, let's turn our attention away from uh, raw network performance to actual real use cases. In the end, this is not a hardware summit. This is Spark Summit, right? So um, the, the, the question of interest here is, can we use all that fire, hardware firepower to boost Spark workloads? Can, can we use, for instance, the low latency network and the fast flash to maybe disaggregate storage as well? Can we extend the memory of Spark workers with remote memory or even remote flash? And the answer to all these questions, hopefully, at the end of the talk will be, yes, we can do all these things. So um, like, on the other hand, Probably you can guess we wouldn't be here if things were just straightforward. So to uh, 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 give you an idea of what are the key challenges here, uh, let's see how a simple sorting workload performs on such hardware. Sorting is actually uh, a very good fit for such hardware because, or, or a good fit for fast storage and networking hardware because it's a very I.O. intensive workload. The basic structure of a sorting a job in Spark is shown here. It's a, it's a simple MapReduce job where all the data is read from storage, shuffled over the network, and written out, right? So the question is, how, how fast does this, does this perform on NVMe flash and 100 gig? So we ran this job on a, a 128 node cluster, uh, the sorting 12.8 terabytes of data, that is 100 gig per node. And uh, the cluster we use, all nodes in that cluster are interconnected using a 100 gig network with full bisection bandwidth. Bisection, full bisection bandwidth means that all nodes can essentially uh, send and receive concurrently at full line speed without the switch becoming the bottleneck. Um, also, the, the nodes, each node has half a terabyte of DRAM and about four times 1.2 terabytes of NVMe SSDs. Uh, this is designed in a way that the, the, the total flash bandwidth available per node matches the network bandwidth. All in all, from a storage and network hardware perspective, this is about the best you can buy today, or is, is very close to what you can, the best you can buy today, I guess. So the question is, how fast does sorting perform on such hardware? And I'm going to skip the full performance details for the moment. I will get back to it later. But instead, I will show how the network is being used uh, in a, in a, uh, in a uh, sorting run. Mostly that's during the shuffle phase. And this is how the network is being used, right? Five to 10 gigabits, um, uh, roughly, uh, out of 100, right? So th that, that's disturbing. Uh, that's, let's say, poor usage of very expensive equipment, right? So uh, wh what's going wrong here? So um, there's two, two issues, uh, if you want. Like, uh, first issue is Spark doesn't use the user-level APIs, right? It, it can't do so easily, right? This is uh, uh, something I didn't mention explicitly before, but user-level APIs require applications to be implemented specifically for the user-level APIs. In this case, Spark would, be, would have to be implemented against those APIs. HPC applications are implemented this way, right? But Spark is not yet an HPC system. It's a general purpose data processing framework, right? So Spark is using the kernel-based interfaces, which is a fair thing to do. It's the only thing you can do if you want to be uh, able to run on all platforms. But obviously, there's some performance that's going to be left on the table here. Um, the second uh, problem, if you want, is that um, aside from the kernel overheads, there's some overheads in Spark and in the JVM as well that those, those overheads are not necessarily a problem if you run on a one gig network or on hard disks, but they start to become problematic if you run at the speed of 100 gigabits per second. So 
to give you an idea, this is the code path that is executed during a shuffle uh, uh, in the map part of the shuffle uh, operation. Um, uh, the objects have to be serialized. They're pre-sorted to avoid the, uh, to, to minimize the number of files on the file system. Data has to be moved out of the JVM into the file system, and if there's memory pressure, data is going to be paged out on disk, right? Uh, that's the map phase. Let's shift to the side and see the reuse side is basically the inverse of this. So again, uh, data coming from the network has to be deserialized into uh, the JVM uh, uh, and so on. And without, like, let's say, a, an in-depth understanding of this process here, you can probably feel that this is very difficult to actually run at the speed of 100 gigabits per second, right? So how can we, how can we fix this? W one thing we can do is we could try to reduce the code path uh, in the shuffle implementation, both inside Spark and from the kernel down to the hardware by using user-level APIs. But then there is not just shuffling, right? There is uh, other operations that could benefit from fast networking and storage hardware like broadcast, uh, RDD caches, uh, RDD transport, uh, partition transports if, if, if the data is not uh, co-located with the compute task, or um, data sharing in more complex jobs that uh, consist of, of multiple stages, right? So ideally, we would like to come up with a solution that works for all of these operations. And really, the challenge, big challenge here is to come up with a generic solution, because if you remember the beginning of the talk, also the, the hardware uh, technologies that are around is diverse. So now we have NVMe, Flash, RDMA, but in the future, we might have something else. So we want to come up with a solution that works with whatever technology is going to come up. Also, I, didn't, I, I touched on this briefly uh, in the beginning. There's not just performance. There are new modes of deployment coming up uh, that are interesting, like uh, resource disaggregation, heterogeneous clusters. So we want the solution that works in these cases, too. And of course, in whatever we do, we want not just to improve the situation. We want to get close to the, we want to get close to the hardware performance limit. So, to tackle all these problems, what we've come up with is a new open source platform called CRAIL. CRAIL essentially consists of three parts. Um, at the top, the, we have a series of modules that implement high-level I.O. operations, like shuffle or broadcast or interjob data sharing. Uh, these modules can be plugged into Spark at runtime. At the core, we have uh, the Crail distributed storage system, which basically acts as a high-performance uh, 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 storage backbone for uh, those modules. The modules actually are very thin because most of the functionality is implemented inside the Crail storage system. And at the bottom layer, we have the different storage backends or storage tiers. Uh, these tiers are responsible for transferring data between a Crail client running in a Spark uh, um, executor and the storage nodes, the Crail storage nodes that are distributed across the cluster. So currently we have two storage tiers in Crail, a RDMA-based DRAM tier and a NVMe-based flash tier. So how is this fixing all the problems we've been talking about, right? First, the, we are supporting a series of I.O. operations. Those uh, are offered in terms of modules. New operations could be easily built because the modules are very thin on top of the Crail store. Crail store itself is designed from scratch for user-level APIs. In fact, it doesn't just bypass the kernel. It bypasses the entire stack, including the, the JVM and, and parts of the, the Spark runtime as well. And third, Crail itself is a framework. So different storage tiers can be plugged in, new technologies can be supported easily. So, but this is not a, a talk about Crail, uh, it's, it's about how to actually use Crail to uh, use the hardware effectively. But still, let me spend two more slides to show you sort of how the different components here uh, play together. Again, I'm using the example of a shuffle operation to, to, to show that. So, this is the map phase of the shuffle operation again, and also in Crail we have to serialize objects, right? Only that we do, we do this with a single copy, which is 
uh, uh, going into a buffer that is managed by the Cradle uh, storage layer. And from there, data is moved uh, to the storage backends. So that could be either local or remote uh, memory or local or remote flash. All the local data transfers are implemented using memcopy. All the remote data transfers are implemented using user-level APIs, as discussed before. And again, the, the reduced phase is basically just the inverse. Data is coming in from the storage backends uh, with a single copy, and they're being serialized into the uh, uh, Spark runtime. So now let's, one thing I also want to point out is this is, again, uh, this is the example of a shuffle operation, but the other modules on top, like the broadcast module and so on, they work very much uh, the same way. So now let's move on and see how this how all of this performs. Um, uh, we uh, have uh, a similar setup, the same type of hardware we had before, only that this time we didn't have access to the full 128 nodes, unfortunately, um, except for the sorting benchmark, which I will revisit uh, as well. Um, the, some experiments we compare with the Aluxio memory system. The, there we use Aluxio version 1.4. We use Spark version 2.1. And one important property in any Spark deployment, and particularly for this type of experiments, is always where you put the uh, temporary directory. What we do is we put the temporary directory on a RAM file system for the micro benchmarks. Uh, that's to get the absolute best performance out. And um, otherwise, we put the temp directory on flash. That's uh, what you would do in practice for larger runs. So let me start. Uh, with the first experiment, which is a broadcast microbenchmark. So broadcast, as all of you know, I'm sure, is a way to uh, distribute data um, uh, from, let's say, uh, your, across, across your task. Uh, SQL has been mentioned before. SQL is using broadcast. It's used, for instance, in graph processing systems also, or machine learning, and so on. And um, what we do here is uh, we, um, the benchmark is, is actually uh, um, issuing a, a large number of broadcasts. Uh, um, the driver is, is creating a large number of broadcast objects uh, and then scattles the tasks, and the tasks are going to read these broadcast values one by one, and we measure the read latency of these broadcasts. So we essentially amortize the cost of job scheduling by having each task read multiple broadcast objects. And what you can see from the figure first is that with the uh, Quail-based broadcast module, we can improve the uh, default broadcast implementation by about two orders of magnitude, but more importantly, the broadcast uh, latency we get is very close to the actual hardware latency, which is shown by the gray line here. Uh, the, so the gray line is essentially computed out of the, 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 the three messages that are being required to, uh, to fetch a broadcast uh, um, uh, object from Crail. And uh, in the blue, in the yellow part you see there, uh, I'm showing how the broadcast object is stored inside Crail. Crail is a hierarchical storage system, so that allows us to group together objects that are similar, like broadcast objects and shuffle objects and so on. Now, the next type of benchmark I want to show is a um, uh, is a group by. Uh, here we are measuring the shuffle performance. Uh, and, uh, so we are interested not in latency this time, but in, in throughput. Uh, we are, the, in, the, in the group, we are, we, are, we are issuing a group by on 80 million keys. Uh, um, each, each key is associated with a 4K value, so that's a total size of 300 gigabytes of data. And, uh, and we are uh, running this experiment once with the uh, Crail shuffle engine and also once with the default shuffle engine you get. Uh, and we run it for, for three different configurations, one, four, and eight cores. And if you pick the red line, which is the one core experiment, you see that uh, the, using the Crail shuffle engine on top of the 100 gig network is about five times faster. And it reaches a network usage of close to 80 gigabits per second. So that's... Um, it's not 100 gigabits, it's not line speed, but it's reasonably close to it, right? 
Um, now, if we increase the number of cores, the gap between these two shuffle implementations decreases. At some point, it's ending at like 2x. And the reason is like, uh, this, this group is so heavily network bottlenecked that so at some point throwing in more cores is just not improving the situation anymore, right? Um, but you can see that uh, we can actually perform as fast or faster with a single core than uh, the traditional shuffler performs with eight cores. Again, in the yellow part, we show how the uh, uh, shuffle data is stored inside the Cradle storage system. So basically, uh, different key ranges are mapped to different Cradle namespaces. But uh, uh, there's more to be said here. Maybe uh, talk to me offline if you're interested in, in the details. Um, now, the next incrementally more complicated thing you can do uh, from a group by experiment is, again, the sorting benchmark. Uh, that's uh, something we have been running, uh, again, on the 128 node clusters. So that's basically matching the, uh, the, the experiment I was using in the motivation initially. And here, uh, what you see is that we can actually uh, reduce the runtime by a factor of x compared to the default implementation. And on the right-hand side, you see also how the network is being used. So that's showing for each reduced task at what speed the task is being able to fetch data from the network. So you see, this is about 70 gigabits per second. That's slightly lower than in the group by case, but that only makes sense because uh, in the sorting benchmark, we are actually sorting the data in the reduce phase. And uh, sorting is a very CPU intensive task, so to make this possible, we already uh, engaged a native sorter. Uh, this wouldn't be able to, to uh, it, these numbers wouldn't be able to achieve with the uh, default uh, uh, Java sorter we have uh, in, the, in the shuffle implementation. Now, uh, sorting is a, is, is, a, is a widely used benchmark. The, there's co competitions uh, on this every year. Uh, this table is just illustrating it to you how fast the sorting performance is we got. So by comparing the, the rate per core to, uh, with the winner of 2014 of this benchmark and the, the winner of 2016 as well, and you see that we, we get about 3.1 gigabytes per minute as a sorting rate per core. That's only 27% lower than w the winner got this year, uh, or last year, sorry, which is 4.4 gigabytes. And the interesting thing here is that uh, the winner in 2016, this, is, this has been a uh, native benchmark written in C from scratch just to do sorting while we are using a general purpose data processing system with a slightly enhanced shuffle engine. So that's uh, quite interesting, I think. Now, um, another slight variation of the, these shuffle experiments is, uh, is a SQL join experiment. Uh, this is using the, the shuffle-based implementation of, of, or it's actually using the shuffle um, plug-in to, to exchange data as opposed to the broadcast mechanism, which is used if the data is small. But here, data is reasonably big. We are joining two data sets of 64 gigabytes, producing an output data set of around 100 gigabytes. And uh, uh, in contrast to previous experiments, here we also store the input and output data sets in Crail, and we compare the runtime to a completely in-memory deployment when using Alluxio for input and output. And you can see we can reduce the runtime by a factor of two uh, compared to, to this setup. Now, so, so far all these experiments have been completely in memory, right? And uh, um, what, what I want to show is now two experiments that actually use Flash. So the first experiment here is to explore to what extent we can replace DRAM with, with Flash and what we did is we just gradually uh, de decreased the DRAM tier in Crail and ramped up the NVMe tier up to a point where all the DRAM was replaced by Flash. And uh, we are again running the sorting benchmark, but this time we are putting input shuffle data as well as output data into Crail. So this is different from before where we used HDFS for input and output. 
And what you can see here is that uh, the, in the bar, you see the memory flash ratio. So we start with 100% in DRAM, and then we gradually move to a point where everything is in flash. And you can see at the point where the entire data set is in flash, we take about a 48% hit in terms of performance. So that's, I think, quite interesting. It basically, uh, in the context of flash being much cheaper per byte to store than, uh, than DRAM, it means if you're willing up to give a little bit of performance, you can basically uh, run certain tasks much more cost effective. Now, the final experiment I want to show is on this aggregation. Um, this aggregation is, a, again, it's a very promising new type of uh, deployment uh, where storage is separated from compute. So what we do here is we divide the cluster into two parts, a storage part and a compute part. And in the storage part, we just run create storage nodes. We, we are not running any, uh, any comp Spark executor on that part. So uh, again, we are doing the sorting uh, benchmark here, which is uh, kind of a stress test for this because it's so uh, IO intensive. And we are storing, again, both input, output, and shuffle data inside Cryo. That means in this setup, all data access has to go through the network. Data is being fetched from the network, shuffled over the network two times in the map phase and the reduce phase, and eventually written out over the network. And the figures you see on the left, the two, uh, the two tuples of bars there, you can see that we can actually run this configuration with zero performance penalty. It means we can move the entire data out of the compute nodes and we can still run at the same performance when we actually run uh, in a co-located mode. So that, that, that basically can be attributed to the very efficient network implementation we have in Crail, so that there's no cost here. On the other hand, if you use Aluxio uh, in the same configuration, then there is uh, some penalty when, you, when we move to the disaggregated case. So that brings me to the end. Um, so uh, I hope I was to able to convince you guys that uh, running Spark effectively on high-performance networks and flash is challenging. Crail is an attempt to tackle this problem uh, uh, and to rethink how data processing systems should work with that type of hardware, not only for Spark. And, uh, the, the thing that made all this possible now in the context of Spark is really the modular architecture Spark has that allows us to uh, plug in and replace certain components at runtime. Um, I want to uh, also mention that Crail is completely open source. Uh, the entire code and the benchmarks that I have uh, presented to, uh, to produce all these numbers, all of that is basically open source available on GitHub. And then I want to mention that Crail is a, uh, is a larger team effort with a, um, a few people involved. And if, you, if you're interested in contributing, uh, um, please send us an email. That's it, yeah, thanks a lot. All right, we got time for one or two questions. Uh, does the Crail platform have any uh, commonalities with the machine from HP? I know the machine project, but I don't know enough about it to actually uh, uh, answer that question. So, um, it, my understanding, the machine project is a rack scale type of machine, uh, and Crail is essentially the software that type of software that could be run on such a on such an architecture. So, uh, the machine seems to me more like a hardware project. This would be the matching software project for it. Uh, hi, two questions. Uh, one, how much of Crail is specific to Spark or is, can generic JVM applications use the Crail library? And second question is, have you used uh, Crail on, a on AWS, specifically the i3 instances? Okay, first question was about how much of this is specific to Spark. So uh, the, uh, um, the top level, so I, I mentioned Crail is essentially, uh, consists of three parts. The top level of this is Spark specific. Uh, the bottom two layers are absolutely not Spark specific. They have no, no Spark dependency in it. And in fact, we have been uh, experimenting uh, with other 
frameworks too. Um, about the AWS, we didn't run any experiments on AWS. I'm also not sure if AWS has a hardware Yeah, I don't know. I, last time I checked, the HPC instances were still quite far from the hardware we, uh, uh, we, we have been building the system for, but yeah. All right, we're out of time. Let's thank Patrick once again, and you can find him offline.